Hey, how's it going? Thanks for coming, everybody. Really appreciate you being here. Um, as you just heard, I used to be um, a correspondent um, overseas. I spent a lot of my time um, in the Middle East. Uh, I covered the end of the Iraq War. That did actually end. Um, I covered the Arab Spring uprisings um, in Yemen, Bahrain, Egypt, Syria, and then of course in Syria I covered the thing that became a war after the uprising. Um, and what I tried to do as a journalist, as a reporter, um, was sort of go beyond what we in the business call bang bang. Sort of a cynical term, right? But it's sort of, you know, the bombs and the fighting and the misery and the Right, and I tried to make what was happening over there feel real to people here. Um, and when I got back home from the Middle East in 2013, moved here to Los Angeles, a little bit of a culture shock, um, a lot of people would say to me, well, why don't you just do that thing that you did? You know that thing you did in the Middle East? Do that here. Like, do that in America. Um, and so I decided, of course, to make a podcast. Um, <laughs> this, of course, was before everybody had a podcast. I think only half of everybody had a podcast. <laughs> it was 2015. Um, and we decided to call the podcast Embedded. Um, and the idea was really, really simple. Was just take a story from the news headlines and just go deep, right? Just go there, be in it, live in it, figure it out, and tell people about it. Um, I started this show with my wonderful colleague, Tom Dreisbach, who's in the back, and I'm going to embarrass you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we basically, when we started the show, we, you know, it was like, we just started piloting stuff. We're just like, all right, well, let's just figure out what we want, what we're interested in, what we, what we care about. And in the very beginning, we actually spent a bunch of time um, on Skid Row, uh, just after a homeless man was killed by police. I don't know if you guys remember this story. Um, just outside his tent. Um, and so we spent a ton of time with cops. Uh, we're really interested in policing, right? Like how does something like that happen? So we went on walk-arounds, we went on drive-arounds, we got to know all the different sort of approaches, shall we say, that police use. Um, of course there's community policing, which is going out, talking to people, building rapport, and then, of course, there's the so-called broken windows approach, which is a much harsher report approach. It's, you know, arresting people for small stuff, like loitering, public drinking, right? And the idea is to get people off the streets in hopes that they won't commit bigger crimes. We all know how well that went um, in New York City and, and beyond. And so we saw both of these approaches at work at Skid Row, right? In Skid Row, right? Like, during the day, they were like, look! see, we're talking to people, we're making friends, we're building rapport, and then at night it was a very different story, very different story. Skid Row is a complicated place, a lot of issues, it's not just about policing, it's about a whole bunch of other stuff. But so today when folks asked me to talk about justice, I thought I would talk about the reporting that we have done since then on policing. It's something that we dug in on a lot um, on the podcast and on the radio. Um, obviously it was not just Skid Row, where people were getting killed by police, right? It is happening all over the country. It is happening right now. Um, and we started our work in 2016, you might remember, that was a real bad year, right? Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Terrence Crutcher, and 959 other people were killed by police in that year. Um, and so we really started to dig in on it. We really wanted to, to think about it and learn about it as much as we could. And what we were fascinated by, of course, were these videos that were capturing these incidents. And the question we had was really simple, right? It was like, are these videos making things better or worse? Um, and so what we do, we decided to pick three incidents that happened that were captured on video. Um, one an unarmed black man who was killed by police. Um, we looked at a case in North Carolina, spent a bunch of time looking at that. Two, we looked at a police officer who was shot and killed, right? And we wanted to look at this too because this is what cops always talk about. You know, well this is the danger we face in the field and this is why we have to use force because we, we ourselves are in danger, right? And the third video we looked at is the story I'm gonna tell you today. 
it's a really interesting story. And so what I'm going to do is just kind of tell you a story. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> That's what we do. Instead of giving talks, I like to tell stories because it's what I do all the day. Um, before I do, I do want to issue a pretty serious uh, warning. Um, seriously, you're about to hear and see a lot of yelling and cursing um, very in a very escalated tone. You're going to see people with weapons. I just want you all to know that. Everybody cool with that? It's definitely going to um, wake you up. Okay. Okay. So here we go. It was April 16, 2015, in a suburb outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. And what's happening is a cop is following a man in a car. And the man he's following is suspected of killing his girlfriend and his best friend just a few hours before this happens. And the cop's been chasing the guy for a while. The suspect turns his car into a side street. He gets out of the car, and he starts running toward the cop. And so the cop gets out of his car with his gun drawn. Here's <laughs> So as you can see right here, the suspect has his hand in his pocket. And usually, in videos like these, this is the moment when the officer shoots. And shootings like this are almost always ruled <coughs> justified. And why is that? Suspect was coming at me. Suspect could have been reaching for a gun. Suspect was asking to be shot, right? And he was therefore a danger to me and others. That's what you hear so often. But that is not what happened this time. <laughs> body camera. His police chief later released the video to local media. And after that, Jesse Kidder, the cop, became a kind of hero. A local TV station in Cincinnati interviewed him about what happened that night. Law enforcement officer all across the nation of field split second decisions that in line for death. I wanted to be absolutely sure before I used deadly force. Jesse Kidder says when he first saw Michael Wilcox, his hands were out of his pockets and empty. And then when he put his hands in his pocket, Kidder kept his eyes on that pocket and nothing else. And a few weeks later, Kidder was invited to a police forum in D.C. And here's what he said about Michael Wilcox. I knew he had crossed the line to where I could have used deadly force, but um, I just felt that, you know, just because you can take a life doesn't mean you should. Just because you can take a life doesn't mean you should. The moderator at this conference says to Kidder's boss, Chief, you got a brave officer here. Thank you so much, Officer Kidder. And everybody claps and applauds. And so what we wanted to know was why. What was it about Jesse Kidder that made him not shoot that night? Comedian Larry Wilmore talked about it on his show a few days later. Well, this is new and different. <laughs> it's ending without a single shot being fired. What is going on in the universe? That is one lucky brother. Can I get a closer look at the suspect? <laughs> oh. Oh, he's white. We'll be right back. So I, of course, asked Jesse Kidder's police chief about this. He's also white. And he said it's not about race. Um, but given what we know, of course, about police bias, it is hard to think that race had nothing to do with this, right? But Chief Harvey did say that it is about something else. 
And that is the fact that Jesse Kidder was a Marine who did two tours in Iraq. He credits his reactions that day, you know, with his military training. And this totally surprises me. Um, most people think soldiers come home from the military and they're trigger happy, right? Like somebody who'd be more likely to shoot, not less. And so I asked Chief Harvey, was Kid Kidder in a similar situation in Iraq, like the one he was in with Michael Wilcox? I think he, he did use force. And um, there, there was a difference. It was just different, you know. But it knows what it feels like to use But it knows what it feels like, yeah. Jesse Kidder also told people that he had been in deadly force situations while he was a Marine. And we do know that Kidder was awarded a combat action ribbon in Iraq, which means that he was under en enemy fire and engaged the enemy at some point. <clears throat> but the interesting thing here is that this is something more and more police chiefs and trainers are starting to understand. That veterans are actually sometimes more patient and less likely to pull the trigger. In a lot of cases, they actually have more life experience in stressful situations than young recruits out of the police academy. For Chief Harvey, this whole thing came down to what he called Kidder's sixth sense, an instinct that you get from experience. Like you can train a cop as much as you want. You would go to as many classes as, as you want. But you can't just give a cop experience. And Harvey, this police chief, says he had a similar thing happen to him a few years ago. His experience on the job made it clear to him what he needed to do. He was on a porch with a guy who was waving a gun back and forth, and then he was waving it at himself and at Harvey, and Harvey was able to calm the guy down to suss out whether or not the guy was a threat. And what he did was actually try to look down the barrel of the guy's gun. I could tell, I could tell by looking in the cylinder that there was no round. The only question was, was there a round where the hammer was? And at one point in time, he, he pulled the trigger on himself, and it didn't go off. So then you knew there were I no knew. rounds in the gun? I knew. And I calmly walked up to the guy, and I said, this is over. And I took the gun out of his hand, put my arm around him, say it's going to be all right. And I got, I got, I got strongly criticized for that. He got strongly criticized for that. Because while he was on that porch, there were all these SWAT teams in the yard, and they saw this guy waving a gun at Harvey, and Harvey just talking to the guy. I just, I, I got that sixth sense. I felt very comfortable that, that the guy was not going to hurt me. You know? So I knew what Officer Kidder was talking about when he told me that. I knew what, I knew what he was saying. I got it. He felt okay. He felt like he wasn't going to be harmed. And you told him that? Mm-hmm. You told him that story? Yes. Like I said, Harvey was criticized by his own people for not shooting. And that same thing eventually happened to Jesse Kidder after that night with Michael Wilcox. To some cops, like the ones at the conference in D.C., Kidder deserved praise for showing restraint. To other cops, not so much. Here are some posts that we found online. Officer Jesse Kidder is a fine human being who needs to be fired immediately. Why Jesse Kidder should have shot Michael Wilcox. How not to do police work. Officer refuses to shoot charging some suspect. In one Reddit thread, someone wrote, I think Mr. Kidder's going to get himself or another officer killed. Were I an officer in his department, I wouldn't want him backing me up. At one point, Chief Harvey says the criticism got so bad that Jesse Kidder started questioning everything. He was really second-guessing um, his career as a law enforcement officer right out of the get-go, you know? And he was thinking about quitting and uh, getting out of this business. Some of the criticism was coming from officers in his own city. And that was hard for him to accept. Chief Harvey eventually talked Jesse Kidder out of quitting, and Jesse Kidder eventually moved on from the tiny New Richmond, Ohio Police Department, which is a town of about 2,500 people, to Fairmont County, which is about 200,000 people. And since going to work there, Jesse Kidder has gone quiet. We talked to him on the phone, but he politely said he didn't want to talk about this case anymore. Chief Harvey says, 
Jesse Kidder just wants to keep his head down and do his job. So that's one part of the story. <laughs> There's another part of the story. Um, and that is that run-in that Officer Jesse Kidder had with Michael Wilcox was not the first time that Michael Wilcox was stopped by police that day, that same day. And the other time he was stopped tells us something about how police videos are affecting our world. So, about a half an hour before this video was taken, Michael Wilcox was stopped by two people named Vicki and Buddy Coburn. At the time, Vicki was a cop and Buddy was an investigator for the county prosecutor. And the Coburns, we should say, they're married. They actually met on the job 30 years ago. So I was working the evening shift when he came in. And I was just a hoodlum. When he walked in the door, there was another lady that was working with me. And I told her, I said, man, it's a shame he's married. Turned out he wasn't. <laughs> The night of the incident, Vicki and Co but sorry, Vicky and Buddy Coburn were off duty, but then they got this call that there had been a murder, and then they saw a car on the road that matched the description of the suspect's car. We see this maroon colored vehicle coming towards us, and I, or I asked Vicky, I says, what car are we looking for? And she says, that's it. That car was being driven by Michael Wilcox, and so Vicky and Buddy, they force him to pull over on the side of the road. Buddy walks up to the driver's side, he pulls his gun. Vicky's right behind him. I reach in, I grab the guy by his shirt, and I got my gun up to his head, and I'm saying, you know, show me your hands, show me your hands. And he, he starts waving his hands around, and he gets this evil, evil look on his face. He's screaming, screaming, kill me, kill me, you blankety blank, kill me. And he says, I did it, I did it, I killed her. I got a gun, kill me, and he lunged forward. And Buddy says Wilcox was trying to grab his gun. And then Wilcox did this. He lunges forward, reaches to the floorboard, and when he does, we both simultaneously jerk him back up. And he didn't come up with a gun. And as he came back up, he hit the ignition switch, and slammed it in gear, and away we all three went. Wilcox was dragging Buddy and Vicky like with his car for a few seconds, and then eventually they let go. Wilcox kept driving. Vicky called it in. Buddy and Vicky. And here again, you have to ask, why didn't they shoot Michael Wilcox? Especially if they thought Wilcox was going for Buddy's gun. Again, Buddy and Vicky are white. But Buddy says there was also something else. I, I have a theory on why I didn't kill him. What is it? I think a lot of it has to do with the media and the portrayal of police officers shooting people. That was in the back of my mind. In that moment? In that moment, that, that was, that, I mean, it was in my mind enough that I was thinking, see the gun, see the gun, don't you kill him till you see the gun. But he was actually thinking, oh, this could end up in the news. Maybe I should think twice. Th this idea, right, that cops are more reluctant to use force since these incidents started to be recorded, it actually has a name. It's called the Ferguson Effect. This idea that ever since white police officer Darren Wilson shot and killed Michael Brown, 2014. And the massive protests and scrutiny of police that followed, cops are somehow more hesitant. <clears throat> and that, some say, has led to a rise in crime. So let's just start with the first point, that cops are more wary on the job. A Pew Research Center survey of 8,000 cops did find three quarters of them say they are more reluctant to use force. There's no way really of telling how that plays out on the streets, though. And then there's that second part, right? If they are more reluctant, has that led to a rise in crime? People on the right say yes. People on the left say no. And researchers say this is a really hard thing to study, basically. <laughs> crime rates are complicated. Before I stop, there is one more person in the story that we need to hear from. And that is Michael Wilcox. 
Okay, this is a guy who killed two people that day. He pled guilty to killing his girlfriend and his best friend, and he is now in prison. Um, we actually have a recording of an interview that investigators did with Wilcox. <clears throat> and what it tells us is these videos of police shootings that we're seeing in the news were in his mind, too. The interrogation starts with the detective's voice. What was going through your head? I want to die. <laughs> Dude, that's fair. That's fair statement. Um, so I got out. I'm crazy. Because I see on the TV all the time that people get out and crazy and get shot. The detectives asked Wilcox what he would say to Officer Jesse Kidder. If you could talk to an officer right now, what would you tell him? <laughs> I mean, all of that, all of what I did was intentional, and I just want to tell him thank you. And that he is a, he's, I didn't know there's officers like that, honestly. I didn't know, there, I didn't know officers were trained with that much self-control anymore. Honestly, I didn't, because I hear about all the time, so I think this peep cop gets shooting up, which me and could just all be fake, I don't know. But yeah, if whatever I hear on TV, that's what I wanted to happen, didn't happen. Yeah. Whatever I hear on TV, that's what I wanted to happen, it didn't happen. So what does this all mean, right? Every single person involved in this case was affected by the videos that we're seeing in the news. Michael Wilcox tried to get shot because he had seen that happen to other people in the news. Buddy Coburn didn't shoot Michael Wilcox because he didn't want to end up in the news. And Jesse Kidder wouldn't have even been on video if he wasn't wearing a body camera. <clears throat> so these videos are changing us. Does that mean we're better off? Are they helping us make society more just? That's the question, right? One law professor and former cop who we talked to says, yes. He says there were two major moments in our history where seeing, really seeing how police do their jobs changed our relationships with the police. One was the civil rights period. And two, was after the Rodney King beating. He says we're in a third moment like that right now. We might not know how it's all going to end up, but these videos are not going away. And what we have to do is figure out how to watch them. Thank you very much.